Greetings, Internet! Episode number 102 of the Comic Walk Show. I'm your host, Matt. And uh, after that jazzy little intro, which is back, uh, we are coming at you this week with author Jeremy Hahn. Going to talk about Comicology Originals uh, 40 Seconds, Red Mother from Boom, and maybe, who knows, some other good stuff. With me, as always, are Nick and Mike. Gentlemen, say hello to the kids at home. Hello, kids at home. (laughs) Once again. (laughs) Well, Jeremy, thank you so, so much for hanging out with us for the next little bit. We appreciate it. You're a busy guy. So, uh, you know, very cool of you to drop by. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm uh, honestly like, uh, I don't know about you guys, but like, even with as little uh, interaction as we're getting, you know, we're not getting to go to conventions, we're not getting to go to signings or doing anything like that. So, this is like kind of the most exciting thing in my week, I guess. Oh. I don't know if that's good, if that's really telling about, you know, what a boring life I lead or just how amazing you guys are so. you'd be amazed how many comic writers and artists we, we we've talked to that all basically say eh there was a lockdown it didn't change my life yeah. so <laughs> so it goes but uh, i mean how are you doing man i mean is everyone are you hell are you healthy is everyone okay yeah yeah we've been you know we've been very fortunate um we've taken it pretty seriously uh, i live in joplin missouri which is kind of like the buckle of the bible belt right there you know And, uh, we've had our ups and downs as a city, you know, there's, there's, uh, some, some people are taking it very seriously. Others are not. And, you know, it's like anything else, there's rises and falls in, in, you know, exposure and stuff like that. But I've been lucky, uh, close friends and family have been okay. You know, I I think the weird thing that you start to run into with anything like this is that we we're all just looking for something, you know, some normalcy, something to be okay. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I've just about burned through my entire Netflix queue, uh, <laughs> you know, just so, uh, you know, but I, I'm just, you know, I, I think the the positive side of it is if you can get in the right headspace as a creative, this is the best time to make things because what the hell else are you going to do? Right. So, you know, you just, uh, Go to your office, sit in the you know, sit at the keyboard, and uh, make things happen. And uh, so has has the pandemic and everything else that's gone on in the year of our Lord twenty twenty uh, impacted your writing, you know, directly or indirectly? I think, um, you know, and for for those that don't know, I I'm both a writer and an artist, so I kind of do both for different projects. And lately, a lot of the things that I've been doing, has, you know, uh, forty seconds. And the Red Mother um, are projects that I'm writing on and working with other creatives. But um, one of the weird things that sort of happened was um, I, I was in close to the middle of the Red Mother writing that for Boom and was really kind of just getting started writing on 40 Seconds for Comixology uh, when all this went down. It's past, you know, what, six months now, right? And, um, I, other projects, my, my drawing projects, they did pencils down. Like a lot of the things that I was drawing, they were like, Hey, we've got to put this on hold or we've got to put it on hold indefinitely or whatever that was. But my writing projects for boom and comiXology, they were like, Nope, we're, we're going to. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep the entire crew working. They were very, very gracious with that. Um, so while I think that um, while I think that we've all had to make adjustments, I've been very fortunate that I've just had to keep writing because we have a schedule. You know, we're on it, and uh, I just, you know, I, I you, you know, you, it's, it's. It's definitely easy to get depressed, to get glum during all this, but sure. it's a little harder to get depressed or glum whenever you're having to uh, still tell weird, fun, cool stories. Well, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in that um, adverse times lead to beautiful art. So I, I'm thinking that, you know, in the years to come, 
after we've recovered to some degree or whatever the new normal looks like, we're going to look back on a lot of the comics and the literature and the music and movies and TV that came out of this time and, and say, wow, there's, there's some really amazing stuff that happened during that time, despite all the hardship. You know, I, I, I really believe so. I, I, and you know, I hope that, I hope that the new normal is, is a okay new normal. You know, I hope that we can all, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm not a super big hugger, but I realized that I just want to hug everybody now that I can't. Right. So, you know, it's, it's that thing where it's like, you know, I miss conventions. I miss, uh, store signings. I, I, I miss, you know, I, I regularly will like take writing sabbaticals to other cities and, uh, I'll go with, you know, like Chicago or Kansas city and, and, you know, having friends there, I'm like, Hey, let's go out to dinner. Let's have drinks. Let's hang out. You know, you can't do that right now. And, so hopefully that whatever that new normal is, is, is a good enough one. I just feel like um, the stuff that people are coming up with, if you can get past the mental hurdle, the block with this, um, you know, people are coming up with some really cool stuff and more than ever, as uh, you know, we can all kind of attest as big fans we need something right now. We need, you know, I, I can't like, I'm a big, I'm a big guy that went to the theater all the time. I would go, mm -hmm. if there was, if they're opening weekend and there was a new movie, especially, you know, we just got out of the summer, right? We didn't get any of our summer blockbusters, none of the big things that we would normally attend for. You know, I wanted to go to the Alamo draft house and watch six movies, you know, that were on my list this summer that all got delayed. Um, we can't get that right now but we sure as hell can get a lot of good comics and it's a, you know, it's a good time for it. If you can, you know, if uh, it, I know stuff's been delayed, but you know, hopefully, you know, stuff can bounce back and come back out and we can continue to uh, get and support the comics medium. Well, of course that it, that's actually, you set yourself up for a perfect segue there to talk about uh, 40 seconds because it being a comiXology original, there's no need to leave the house to get it. So right. <laughs> uh, for those who are not familiar with 40 seconds, do you want to talk about it? Yeah. 40 seconds is a science fiction. It's, it's a my big science fiction story about a group of um, a forward team that goes through a gate to help save another, you know, a, a group of people uh, in, on a world light years away. And they, they, this is like the pre-team that you would send through to make sure everything's okay. Right. So they go through and, um, and quickly realize that everything that they thought was going to happen, the way that it was going to set up is wrong. And, and something is hunting them. And, there's not just one gate that they go through. They have to go through gate after gate after gate. And each gate, once you get to it, it takes 40 seconds to charge. So there's that weird amount of time where you're just having to stand there while this thing opens and you're completely vulnerable. And these terrible things keep coming after them, you know, right as they activate the gates. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, for those of you that, that know my, my work from like the Red Mother, you know, I, I'm a big horror fan, so so anytime that you get a story by me, while it can be a, you know, while it can be a science fiction story or a fantasy story, there's going to be a heavy dose of of creepy stuff in there, and that's what I really I love bringing that also into this uh, 40 seconds. It's drawn by Chris Mitten, who is amazing. Uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Chris Mitten, something's wrong with you, honestly. Uh, okay, maybe not. But, you know, uh, Chris Mitten's worked on uh, a lot of the Mignolaverse stuff. He's worked on some BPRD stuff, uh, Hellboy and, and the BPRD. Uh, he did, I believe, a Rasputin series. He's he's done a ton of stuff there. He did um, uh, several stories, several projects with uh, Anthony Johnston, uh, uh, Umbral was one of them that I really loved. Um, I'm going to blank on other stuff. He worked on some 40, um, 30 days of night stuff with Steve Niles. Chris has been around forever and, and he's, he's a really incredibly talented artist 
that kind of like myself, we, we tend to do end up doing a lot of horror stuff, a lot of kind of dark, scary stuff. And uh, when we started talking about working together, um, I asked Chris what he wanted to do. Like, what's the one thing that you, you know, you really want to do right now? And he was like, I would love to do a science fiction story, something that isn't just dark, dark, dark. And I was like, I've got the thing. So, yeah. Sweet. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, very. Um, Jeremy, thanks again, obviously, you know, for uh, taking the time with us. Um, reading 40 Seconds, it had a huge, like, big sci-fi movie field, almost like a, like, mm -hmm. say, like a Ridley Scott vibe is what uh, I was getting from it. Um, can you speak a little bit more on your influences on how 40 Seconds came about and how that, that whole concept of 40 Seconds uh, being a sci-fi with just a, a yeah, dab I just, horror, I mean, uh, around. I'm I'm 45. I just turned 45 this month, and uh, so I remember my mom talking about this movie Alien that she saw, and at the theater. And I, I was you know I was I was little right, and but um, I remember talking about this movie, and she was and I I was overplaying and like playing with some friends, goofing off. And I remember her talking about this thing busting out of the, of this guy's chest and, and, and she's telling it to some friends and how traumatic it was. And then a little bit later, I remember being her being at the same friend's house and me and the other kids that were my age were off playing and they were watching they, on HBO or whatever it was. They were watching. And she's like, this is that movie I was talking about. You know, we, we're going to watch this together. And I just remember that, like, you know, when you're a kid and there's the, the movie that your parents are watching, maybe you're not supposed to watch it. So you're fascinated by it. So I was I just remember, like, seeing bits and pieces of Alien and kind of the way that that haunted me. Um, and then there were things that were more age appropriate, if still really weird, like black hole is one of the things that I think a lot about, um, that really influenced me, but you know, you've got obviously star Wars and star Trek, both that are huge, huge influences on any kind of sci-fi and fantasy. You know, I, um, I think, uh, there was a show that was on years and years ago called land of the lost that, that I was kind of obsessed with this with the sleeve yeah. stacks and all the crazy, <laughs> right. Like, like, but but it was this weird otherworldly thing, um, and I was just always fascinated by stories that that jump from place to place. You know, even though with Star Trek, with the original series, which is what a lot of what I saw when I was a kid, um, even though those were like all Southern California locations that kind of they did this thing or that thing, but you know, it was all the same. It still felt like magic. It still felt like you know, they were going to all these different worlds. And, and I love that, you know, um, I, I think a lot about um, another thing that, that like, was like lost in space, those, those, the TV show yeah. and the way, again, it was still, you know, stages and, and Southern California locations, but they still seemed magical to me. You had all these creatures that you saw and beautiful, strange worlds and, um, you know, now we've got the, the, the new lost in space and we've got the, the modernized, uh, amazing, you know, uh, uh, like Star Trek and Star Wars where you get to see like things are even more epic, you know, the, the worlds are crazier and all this stuff. And I just kind of wanted to pull all that together and really examine like, um, almost like just, just anything that kind of hopped from place to place. You know, I loved in, in Star Wars the way that you got, um, you know, you got Hoth, you got the ice planet, right? And then you'd be on Dagobah and then you'd be on, you know, Tatooine. And it would it would be such different climates and different things and different challenges for each place. And I just love the idea of these characters going through these forge gates into, you know, you you walk through it and, you know, like like you're you're in... You're at the home base, and then suddenly you're thrown into someplace crazy, and then it's suddenly an ice, you know, like you're on an ice planet or whatever it is, and you're not, you know, being a forward team, they don't know what the danger is. They only have a little bit of information 
from what's come before. And, uh, you know, I, it's just, for me, these kinds of stories, and, and, and I'm a big believer in acknowledging that, like, um, so many stories have already been told, right? Like, like there's, there's, I mean, there's, you know, you, you get that great X-Men poster back behind you there, you know, and it's like, like, you know, I, like, that the the themes that X Men dealt with, we can't help but get away from the X Men. If you're trying to deal with with um, with superpower beings and 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 a an examination of racism, you know, it's like like there's those things that you kind of pull in. There's a language for what's come before, but it's up to us to take those things and do a mashup and make it new and and mm -hmm. make it you know tell a story through our voice because. Right. You know, my voice is not at all like Claremont's or, or John Burns or, or anyone that's come before. And, and that's part of the joy of all of this. Very well put. Nick, go ahead. Yeah, it's super interesting. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I actually got into your work with The Realm over at Image Comics. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, last year, that finale in October last year was wild. <laughs> but... It's really cool to see you take on a sci-fi story like this. And there's a lot of different complex elements that go into kind of that exploratory nature of the series and, and what you're getting just around the corner. But I'd like to start with a simple question and really what is the significance of 40 seconds as a time period um, and how that relates to the I story? mean, there's there's a highbrow and a lowbrow answer. Uh, so so the, the... We uh, love lowbrow, but we'll <laughs> talk about both. Uh, I really wanted to deal in a, a segment of time for, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever been in like an accident or some, or like a weird situation where time seems compressed in really strange ways. Right. So like, like if you're watching a car come towards your car, what's a second seems like an eternity, right? Like you're, you're, you're hurt or you're scared or whatever it is that period of time seems like an eternity, but you also then think about it and you're like, eh, 40 seconds is not a long time. And I wanted to do a thing where very specifically, there was a time mechanism for how long these gates were open and what that would do. It takes 40 seconds to activate the gate. And then the second that someone goes through it, there's only 40 seconds that the gate stays open. It's a very specific amount of time and it's it's basically an open, you know, an unlocking and locking mechanism. Um, you have to be there. You have to hit the thing, and then you have to, you know, once you go through it, it's activated. And and it's what keeps maybe people from directly following other people. And there's, you know, there's definitely things with that that we're kind of going to explore as it goes on. But um, but I really I just I thought about the idea of. You know, why is it not 30 seconds or 60 seconds or whatever it is? It's, you know, 40 seconds is a very specific amount of time where you, you, it's an eternity to stand there and have people shoot things at you, but it's long enough, you know, it's, it's short enough that it's not, you're, you're not just going to get killed. Like you're, you probably can survive that. And, and it's just this, this theme that kind of goes through, through the thing, this 40 seconds, 40 seconds. Um, I, you know, I, I haven't really spoken much about it beyond this, but like, um, you know, Chris and I have already talked about the idea of there being a second series of, you know, this and what we can do and how that would work and the elements that we would love to pull in. You know, there's, there's, I, I love, I love stories where, um, at, you know, as a, an absolute regal nerd uh you know i've gone my entire life you know like wondering like okay what's what's wolverine's backstory right so like you know but then like if you know too much it's boring right so like like i, I think about horror movies a lot and think about like like before you absolutely knew everything about the killer, they were the most terrifying thing on earth. Mm -hmm. but once you know what that killer or that monster is, it kind of takes out some of the fun. So we answer, we answer the important questions in 40 seconds. As the story goes along, I'm going to give you the answers. It's not going to be super lost ish where it's like, you're not going to get, you know, but, but 
the reality is there's still stuff that I, I can't and to a degree don't really want to necessarily fully say. So then there's room for that. Then there's room for a second series where we can examine this thing and this thing and what that's like. And, you know, I may never give every single answer for everything, but I like it. Back to the lowbrow answer. Um, I thought 40 seconds sounded cool. So, yeah, that's the extra one. Hey, no worries. I like that answer. So, and I get that, you know, obviously you don't want to spoil your story too much. So I don't want to ask too many in-depth story questions. But I am really curious about um, the main characters being numerically named. Uh, what led to that decision? Um, I wanted to make it a pain in the ass for myself and my entire team. I was like, hey, let's call them numbers. So then anytime that I have them call out, you know, their name, I have to make sure that I don't say one, it's one second before, you know, like, <laughs> no, no. Uh, there's a reason for it in the story. Um, and that is one of the things that I promise will get answered. Uh, you may be a little mad at me when I do, but, um, but like, it's something that will get answered and um, there's a definitely a reason for it. Um, one of the things that I really like doing is again, I said it earlier, but um, I don't believe a story should be one thing, right? Like I think that real life is a drama and it has horrific aspects and you know what there's some really you know sometimes it's a little bit sexy sometimes it's a little bit scary sometimes it's actually just laugh your you know laugh out loud funny and i think that that with stories like this i wanted to do something where it's like you have a big epic popcorn action science fiction story that is also a little scary at times and there's definite mystery stuff in there. The reason that you're asking me about the names is because I want you to ask me about the names. Yeah. I want, I want you, you know, there's um, I'm very excited. Uh, one of the things that we originally talked about with this was because it's a comicsology original series, we could control the output of it altogether. I mean, there is a thing that where I could have done this as, four 25 page issues. I could have done it as an original graphic novel. I could have done it, but, but I like breaking it up into chapters like the old serials so that I can have a cliffhanger and then I can go and I can do something else. But there are questions that I'm intentionally seeding into issue one that by the time you're done, you're going to be like, Oh, okay. That's what he right. was. And then you're gonna if you go back and reread the whole thing as one thing, you'll see like this thing that they do here is this thing here, and that leads to this thing. And you know, well, I, I, I definitely can appreciate the fact that you uh, respect your audience's intelligence enough to not spoon feed them everything. Like that that uh, that that to me is the mark of a of a smart writer. So thank you for that. Now that leads, I guess, to a kind of inevitable question: How many issues is uh, Forty Seconds currently plotted for? Uh, it's just going to be five. Okay. Uh, yeah, and and honestly, um, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, I really, you know, I've worked on several long form projects uh, over the past few years, and um, I like the idea that each story needs to very particularly be like, it has to be, you know, sounds dumb, but like it has to be what it is. Right. Like right. some, like, like um, you can have a story that is a page. You can have a, a story that's seven pages with this. I wanted to have a decided summer blockbuster movie feel that had a beginning, a middle and an end. We can absolutely do 40 seconds to the wrath of 40 seconds. That's it's, that's the name right now. I, I just, I just, that's, that's what it's going to be. Uh, but um, <laughs> you know, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> but, but for me, I, I had, you know, um, 
the beauty uh the series that i wrote at image comics with jason hurley um we did 29 issues we're getting ready to release the 30th issue this year so had had a long break between it because comics is not always easy uh you know the the realm uh that you talked about a second ago uh that's that was 15 issues uh we're hoping to get back to that um we left you on a pretty big cliffhanger there um the red mother is 12 issues you know uh I, I, I kind of wanted to examine something and see, put the challenge down to say, I have to build character and I have to make you care about these people and be interesting, but I need a stopping point. You know, I need, I need to have a one and done. So then you can go on to the next thing and you can go on to the next thing. And um, I think, I think as, as, and forgive me, I drawn on, I'm sorry, but, um, no, no. but like, as comic fans, one of the things that really, you know, it hit me whenever I was reading, you know, I was, I was wanting to make comics and I was reading stuff and I was like, I want this series to go on forever, which is great. And as a creative, even sometimes we want to be indulgent and say, this is my epic. It's 300 issues long, but not every story is like that. And and you have to respect that. And, and as an mm-hmm. audience, you have to understand that, the person that's making this thing has a plan and, you know, sometimes stuff has to get cut short early and that's just the way it is. But I would rather tell a story on exactly on my terms and say, this is a five issue mini series I'm in, you know, and then go from there. Yeah. Rock. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jeremy talking about a st- kind of staying on the characters, um, their personalities, um, tend to start to shine and show up, um, I guess you'd say when all hell starts breaking loose. Um, was that part of the original, like when you sat down with the idea of 40 seconds, did you have the idea of um, each characters having kind of their own time with their personalities or did they kind of organically grow as 40 seconds uh, started to When I together? develop a story, I often kind of do it in phases. I, I have... I have, I start with generally a germ of an idea, you know, like, okay, this is what this is. This is, this is the hook. This is the twist. This is the way, you know, I I see that beginning, middle and end. And then very quickly the characters form. But my favorite part, my favorite part is pulling in those characters, whether it's 40 seconds and the characters in that or Daisy and the red mother. I love building character. Um, I've talked about it some, but like one of the things that, and I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to go back to horror as an easy example, but like um, in horror, you, you watch a horror flick and if there's a character, you know, that doesn't have a personality, you'd never care. Like, right? you know, it's like the, like slasher films where they give you like a stack of bodies and they're like, well, we're just going to kill these people. This is kind of the, you know, the, the bad girl, this is the guy that's angry. This is the guy that's kind of too much of a perv. And you kind of, you, you know, like you can almost tell like this guy's going to die here. She's going to die here. This, And you understand like, that's how it goes. But then if you take something, a horror story and you go the other way and you develop the characters Think about those those horror flicks that really hit you, where you're like, you. Uh, I, I love it whenever I, I'm watching something, and I'm so concerned about are they going to break up that when the monster dives through the window and eats the guy, I'm like, oh wait, I'm in that movie. Okay, I forgot because I'm worried about the breakup. <laughs> so in 40 seconds, I wanted to give you, like characters that had plans that had nothing to do with traveling through gates. I wanted, I wanted to, to only want to get back and see her wife and her daughter. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, I needed um, the, the relationship between three and four. And you're like, I think this guy's in love with this lady. I think she really likes him back. And, you know, so you can see those things and, and it, and it builds because 
I'm going to kill people in this story. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to wreck, you know, like, like characters, characters are going to come and go. We're going to bring in more people. We're going to lose people. And, and, and like, that has to have an effect, sure. and, and, you know, and, and I'm not even necessarily using it as emotional manipulation. I just want to know these characters. Mm -hmm. I just want to know um, who they are and how they feel. And, and, as things start to get really crazy in this story, um, it's made more intense by the fact that, that, you know, uh, every time that you're getting a cliffhanger, you're like, Oh wait, was that, was that this, or was that this, you know, or have, have I, have I, how is that going to affect the team? How, what's going to happen from here? Where are we going to go? And Oh, by the way, you know, did they just break up? That's what <laughs> Nick, go ahead. Definitely. I think it's interesting that to, to hear the influence of horror behind your work, because it really shines in the pacing and the structure of almost everything I've, I've seen come from you. And you've done a lot of work with different publishers. So it's interesting to see your work with Comixology kind of follow that in that structure that the cliffhangers work to the benefit of the story. They kind of add tension to everything. It, do you ever find yourself leaning too heavily into the horror where you feel like you need to draw it back a little bit or does it kind of punctuate everything that you're doing? Um, I really try to be, I mean, I, I do try to be a little sparing with it. There is, um, well, okay. So, so one of the things I'll go ahead and talk about a little bit is, and you're going to have to forgive me. This is the stupidest name on earth, but my wife and I joke about the Hauniverse. <laughs> um, That's as, cool. <laughs> as big Stephen King fans, uh, we grew up, my wife and I read Stephen King novels when we were young. We would pass them back and forth and, and um, you know, started, started with uh, the, the Dark Tower, the Gunslinger for me. And then uh, for her, it was Eyes of the Dragon. And so, mm -hmm she handed eyes of the dragon to me and I handed the gunslinger to her and, and that went through and, you know, you read Tommy knockers and it and everything that came along. Yeah. But one of the things that was really fascinating for me was always the way that King had a mythos. He had a story and overarching things that ran through everything that he did. And that can be pretentious and that can be haughty. And, 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 and you know, so it, it has to fit, right? You, you can't just be like, for a moment one, you can't be like, I'm building a universe, get over it. You know, <laughs> like, like you still have to tell stories and they have to be fun and interesting. But when you ask about horror and the influence there, I think that there are themes that I examine again and again. And there is, again, sorry, my Hauniverse, that there are certain things that you're going to see that were, um, uh, I did, uh, it's been a while now, five years, maybe. Um, I did a project with B Claymore, Alex Grecian and Seth Peck, uh, called, uh, bad karma. And mm -hmm. it was a Kickstarter that we did. It was a hardcover, um, anthology kind of series where we all wrote different stories, but they all kind of interconnected in sort of interesting ways. And some of the things that I built into that, I was like, oh, I want to seed here and here and here. And then uh -oh. we, did we blink off for a second? Just for a second. Okay, we good? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> There were things in the bad karma thing that we set up that you see in less in the beauty, but there's still a little bit in the beauty, but then definitely in the realm and then in the red mother and into 40 seconds. And they, that through line kind of always goes there's, you know, and little nods to it. Like sometimes you're going to see that little nod in 40 seconds and it's still a sci-fi story with a little bit of horror, but um, I do try to realize that like everything can't, you know, there's like everything can't be a two hander and have, has to have horror. It's like, 
I, I like the idea that sometimes you're going to tell a story that's just a crime story or just a whatever. But I think that it's okay for me to make it like, um, I think, well, okay. So one of the things I think about a lot is like David Lynch's work, right? David Lynch with Twin Peaks and various things that he's done. I would say that they're kind of horror, but they're also crime stories and they're also examinations of small towns and, and hu humanity and, and weird throwback stories. And all, so all of those, I think that you can have horror moments in anything as long as you're not shoehorning something, as long as you're not more interested in this has to be this kind of thing. Right. Because it, the, and the truth of it is I am going back to that little kid that watched Star Trek and Star Wars and, and that had that obsession with alien, you know, I love fantasy stories, you know, you, you, you know, I'll, I'll drone on about Dungeons and Dragons and, uh, Robert E. Howard and, and, you know, uh, you, all the, you know, uh, the, you know, I'll talk about that, but then I'll go into science fiction and I'll talk about the way that Edgar Rice Burroughs and all the John Carter Barsoom stuff affected me. You know, there's superheroes, you know, like all of these things, I have various stories that I want to tell. And I don't know that I'm ever going to lock myself into being a horror writer to the expense of like, damn it. I want to be able to tell a superhero story. If I want to tell a superhero story, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. One of the interesting thematic through lines that I noticed between both 40 Seconds and uh, The Red Mother was isolation. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in 40 Seconds, it's the, the characters obviously out in the vast unknown of space and time, well, maybe time, I don't know. But, um, you know, space for sure, which harkens back to the uh, alien mm -hmm. uh, of it all that you were mentioning. And then with uh, Daisy and The Red Mother, it's more about her... Uh, psychological isolation and the trauma and uh, pulling through her ordeal from the first issue and trying to figure out who she is again or who she's going to become now, now that she, you know, the person, the person of who she was is shattered. And it, that's a very psychologically uh, isolated process for her. And especially obviously because she has a evil eye that seeing red stuff and, you know, big, right dark skeleton monsters and things. And um, I just, I, I just thought that was a really interesting two different approaches to the same notion. So, uh, you know, kudos to you, but was, was that a particular theme you were striving for or did it just happen that way? <laughs> well, first off, you guys are totally weirding me out because your questions are really good. Uh, Yay! So, We're getting good at this so, guys. Hey, so, here. Yeah. All, all your creative friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, do me a favor. Uh, can you be involved in more interviews that I get invited to? Because this is, <laughs> this is, this has been fantastic. Wow. Oh, um, hey. Hey, awesome. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you just, uh, no, um, you know, I, I think it was something that was a part of both stories and then oddly, I think as uh, we all became so isolated in our day-to-day -day lives uh, recently, um, I think I even saw more of that and felt more of that in there. And, and, you know, both the world of the Red Mother and the world of 40 Seconds, which might be the same world, I don't know. Um, uh, Universe, hashtag. <laughs> both both of those uh you know both of those worlds are not this world right i don't know that covid has happened there or will happen in that world but um the feelings that that we're going through and, and i um we can talk about it a little bit but i i'm doing i'm also doing a series of short stories which again Embarrassing, I called it Hanaverse earlier, but um, but like uh, my wife named this other thing my Hanthology, right? So it's it's my anthology of my short stories. It's, it's everything. It's, it's so egotistic, you know. It's a uh, it's terrible. But um, well, it's beneficial but, that you have a one syllable last name that lends itself to all of this terminology. It really does, and it fits really well because that that like that. You know, it's basically if you add a T to my name, it's haunt. 
But then that U in there is actually a little bit beneficial, you know, because you can add Han and Universe together really easily. And, yeah. you know, Han, Thal, it, it just, it kind of, yeah, it's, it's you know, I, maybe that's the only two words this is going to fit with. I don't know. I'm not going to actually try to keep doing this because otherwise, you know. Uh, I really want you to keep this up. <laughs> I kind of do too. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> uh, it's uh it's ridiculous but but you know it's it's but also that's that weird thing where like if you can't like if you can't kind of make fun of yourself as a creator what the hell are you doing you know like if, if you're yeah. taking yourself so damn seriously that you know that that you can't sort of laugh at the ridiculousness of life and and making eventually things. those writers become parodies of themselves right oh, and yeah. i'm not naming names but you know we can make some speculation there. <laughs> well, I, that's the thing. It's like, we all know how to like, do like the smoldering looking straight at the camera, you know, uh, our uh, creator photo, you know, for the best jacket of our book. Like we all know how to do that. And we all know how to, how to talk about the, you know, the, the vastness of space and, and the, you know, the emptiness of humanity and all those things. We can do that. Sure. But like, I don't know. I'd rather like make a fun story that has depth to it and then maybe make somebody laugh beyond that because that's sort of means. So uh, back, back to your thing though. Um, I really, I really wanted, maybe not one, I needed to deal with isolation and, and, and fear and isolation and loneliness and, um, unexpected need there's a lot of things that have that like you know if, if if we if we all cracked open our 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 like you know the little the, the diary with the little padlock and the key on it you know if we crack that open from this time during covid i think those themes would all go would go through all of our mm -hmm. stuff you know mm -hmm. like, like you know even and i think at first with covid very much it was like introverts be like this extroverts be like this but then even oh, culture <laughs> <laughs> exactly the, but the most introverted of us even at this point are like i really i really just want to hang out with somebody you know it's like i i can't and i you know i i, I feel this and well and it's I, it's it's the fact that we're all going through this shared experience together regardless of introvert extrovert political leaning one way or another, you know, whatever, yeah. we're all having to deal with this in some way, shape or form. And what that it, to me creates is a sort of universal language of, of communication that everyone can respond to in their own way. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I, I always say that like, you know, COVID doesn't really care what our plans are. No, you know, uh, I had a lot of really cool stuff that I was going to do this year and that didn't, you know, I mean, e even, even the promotion of the red mother and 40 seconds, the plan for it, the way we were going to roll it out, the things that we were going to do didn't work out that way. You know, I didn't get to go to, to, you know, uh, we, we were going to have an issue out of, of 40 seconds out just in time for New York Comic Con, which would have been what last week, right? Yeah. And yeah, we would have had an issue out. We would have been able to really promote and talk about it, be there, and it would have been fantastic. And you know, we didn't get that. So yeah, I don't think this thing cares about what our plans are. And yeah, we just have to adjust to that. We have to figure out how to be as okay as we can be. And I think that while I personally don't have a lot of interest in telling a story that is about COVID, I really have a lot of interest in examining some of the feelings that, you know, it, it's therapy for me right now, honestly, you know, I, I can't necessarily talk about some of this stuff, you know, um, the way that I need to, but I can definitely exercise that, that feeling in my art. Awesome. Very well said. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah. Um, from your past working with like Boom and Image and other publishers, um, did you know um, that 40 Seconds was going to be on Comixology or did you, did it kind of just happen that way? Um, so 
like so many creatives, I have a laundry list of projects that I've wanted to do for a long time. So like, like with the beauty or the realm or red mother or, or, or 40 seconds, I, I have this you know list of 20 things. Right. And it's on my wall and it's just there staring at me. Um, and I had this realization because at first I wanted to write and draw everything. I was like, I'm going to write and draw it, you know? <laughs> and then I realized that like, I will never in my life get all of that stuff done. If I'm just writing it. Um, with, with 40 seconds, um, I was having conversations with Chip over at Comixology. And he said the best thing to me. He said, what is the project that you're passionate about? Like, what, what story do you want to tell next? And for me, I, I wanted to do something that was different. I wanted to do something that was not necessarily straight up horror. And I wanted to do something that was fun and big and... You know, I, I like the idea that as a creative, we can play in different sandboxes. And um, so when he asked that, I said, I said, this is the thing that I think I want to do next. Is that OK with you? And he was like, yeah, like, let's, you know, like, let's go for that. And and it was a it was a fantastic feeling having that level of belief in what I was doing. You know, I've. I think it's very easy whenever you start out in this industry, you know, you're, you're the, you're the young kid, you know, you're just, you're like coming in and hopefully you can get a job and I'll draw anything. I'll draw for a boy. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, I don't care. Just let me make comics. Um, which is a great thing. And I, I love that enthusiasm, mm -hmm. you know, and hopefully it doesn't completely just die out in all of us as we go. But, um, but I think one of the things for me that, that really stood out was, was the point where I could say, this is the story that I want to tell because it's important to me. And then having Boom or Image or Comixology believe in me enough to say, just do your thing. You know, like, like not, not even like we're going to micromanage you to death. I mean, the great thing about especially, you know, well, I mean, all, all the projects I've worked on have been like this. But, but like I especially noticed it with, with, comicsology and 40 seconds where they were just like hey what do you want to do how do you want to do it and then and then we agreed to it we set the terms we set the schedule and then they just let us make things very cool and that's beautiful very that's cool. awesome. awesome yeah are you drunk on your own power yeah, because of it <laughs> no i'm drunk on bourbon but i mean that's oh, okay you know, yeah uh, we yeah no uh it's a man's drink yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that um, I I don't know if it's my personality or maybe you know uh, growing up the way that I did. I always I always am very grateful for what I have and where I've come from and and what I get to do. You know, I I do tend to um, you know growing up having to you know take care of my family as much as I did and things like that. I always feel a responsibility. I feel a responsibility to myself, of course, but I, I feel a responsibility to the company. I think, you know, a lot about fans. I think a lot about you guys reading something. Um, I want to do it right. I want to, I want to represent a broad spectrum of people so that whoever's reading that can see somebody that maybe looks like them in, in the story that I'm telling. I want to, I want to create a story that people can enjoy on all the different levels. There's a lot of these things that are very, very important to me. I, I care about my audience and I feel a responsibility towards it. And uh, yeah, so no, my, my drunk is just genuine drunk. It's not usually drunk on power. <laughs> And it's, it's actually a really interesting topic because we have talked to people. Um, we recently did a show with Daniel Warren Johnson, who pretty much exclusively does writing and artwork himself. Right. Uh, the books yeah. that he does, he, he pretty much mandated that he had to be the writer and the artist on it. Mm -hmm. And it was a very interesting position. And when we come into kind of your experience in the industry, we see a lot of, of that role fulfillment in, in a lot of different aspects of comic creation. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to see if maybe you could speak to that experience and how it has better enabled you to be both a writer and an artist. And if you feel like it'll help you culminate those skills to do both at once. Yeah. Um, first off, can we just acknowledge what a horrible person Daniel Warren Johnson is? <laughs> he's, like, he's not pleasant. Smile. <laughs> He's not, you know, like there's just nothing affable about that guy. <laughs> Daniel, you know, if you, Dan, if you're if you're listening, um, feel free to join us again. Uh, you and Jeremy, you guys can hash this out and we'll just sort of referee slash watch, and you know it'll be like a battle of the beards thing. And, uh, you know, we're already nicknamed the Beard Show anyway, so right. basically it works. <laughs> you know that guy's lucky he's talented that's all i'm saying uh, <laughs> no uh yeah no i i, I love daniel's stuff um but um <laughs> I've, I've i've sidetracked myself almost to the my, myself almost to the point of not remembering the question uh basically <laughs> with <laughs> starting out as an artist that really always wanted to write and do things on my terms. I did find a strange thing where it was like, um, I don't know. I, I would, I would, I always thought of myself as a storyteller. Like that was the thing. It really wasn't about drawing things. Um, my mom, whenever I was, um, 12 years old, almost 13, uh, I wrote a Conan novel longhand in this, it was like, like one, you know, like the, the spiral, what the narrow rule spiral notebooks, right? It was like the 500 page one front and back. And, and I, I, I wrote it and it was, I mean, you know, it was, it was 12, right. You know, it was horrible, but, uh, <laughs> but I always wanted to create stories and I wrote things and I drew things and I didn't really differentiate between those two. And then I got older and I got work as an artist and, you know, I kind of found myself saying like, Hey, I write things too, you know, like, but, but um, I don't know. I, th I think a lot about um, Mike Mignola and, you know, he worked with other people and then he, he made Hellboy and he was so nervous about just being an art monkey. You know, he's like, well, I just draw pictures and have ideas. So then he brought John Byrne on to, to script that first arc of Hellboy. The Seed of Destruction was, was scripted by John Byrne. And, and, you know, there's that thing where it's just like, like, maybe just let it go. Maybe just be, you know, be whatever you want to be. If, if you're, if you're a, artist that also dreams of writing maybe be a little bit like more like daniel and just say look this is the deal if you want me you get me for the whole thing good bad ugly whatever it is i'm gonna do it this way yeah you know if it, and other people are not wired that way at all and you know like good for them I, and i i respect the hell out of anyone that's just like hey i just like i just want to draw spider-man for the rest of my life i'll work with whomever like good we need people like that because we need those stories absolutely and and I I love those stories. I love artist and writer roles and just letting them be. But but like with creativity, one of the things that you know it's I heard it for a little while. It was that thing where it was kind of like, hey Jeremy, just stay in your lane. You know, kind of you know just just let the writers write, and you know we're we're the you know we're the artists. We'll just you know like do. But but I find now that I am more free than I ever have been. I have concepts where I'm like, um, I, I have, I have one more thing that I need to just draw working with, um, with, with a friend on uh, a writer friend. I'm, he, he, he wrote it and I will draw it. Um, and then I think probably for about three years straight, I am going to only draw stuff that I write or I am going to write something that somebody else is drawing. And that's just it. That's what it's going to be. 
because that's what that's those are the stories that are in my head. And back to that list of 20 things. I want to get through that list before I die. And I keep adding other stuff to it. So, you know, come on. It's like, it's, the muse. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, it, it, and it's interesting that you, that you put it that way. And, and, uh, Daniel Warren Johnson as well, because, you know, when, you know, you're young ish teenager, you know, twenties, whatever, you know, and you're thinking about, you know, breaking into comics you're like oh i want to write wolverine that's going to be so awesome with the claws and the healing factor and yeah and then you know you you get to marvel you you know you bust your ass you get to marvel and you find out wow there's a lot of shackles on me like i can't just do what i want i've got boss editors to answer to or assistant editors and they have group editors and then there's the editor in chief and then there's Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And suddenly that dream starts to turn a little sour. And I think that's where you start to see a lot of writers that maybe that I, you know, I was totally into in the eighties or nineties that maybe aren't having so much output now. And I think that's because they were in this mindset that working at the big two was the end goal. But now you've got this generational shift that's happened where, yeah, you cut your teeth at Marvel or DC or whatever, but then you use that to springboard and do your uh, do, do your passion project at Image or Boom or Comixology or wherever you have it. And I'm, I'm starting to wonder now if this, it you know, this is me, this is the package and just bypassing the big two altogether and just doing you from the start might be the third iteration of that, of that gradual evolution. Uh, do, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Well, I respect the hell out of anybody that has that much understanding about themselves from the beginning, you know, and I, and I do think you're absolutely right. I do think there is a new generation of creators. I mean, and you can see it, like, especially across web comics. And I mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what guts is the, is the biggest selling graphic novel of all time now. Right. I mean, pretty much like it's, it's mil millions are close. Um, but, um, you know, still tons and tons of stuff. If I'm wrong. I'll accept it, but you know, it, it's, it's a massive, you know, massive, massive sales. Right. So, so we're to the point right now where people can do things anyway. I, I know people that are releasing, um, that are releasing, uh, a, a, an epic 300 page graphic novel, three to five pages at a time via Patreon, collecting it, you know, building towards a collection that's finally going to be the big hardcover thing. And, and you know, they're making tons of money. They're doing really well. They're doing things the way they want to on their terms. Um, I, I love that idea. And and I think that, like, for, for me and a lot of my friends that are of very much of the same age and came up around the same time, a lot of us talk about this thing where, like, we came in in the early 2000s where it was kind of an interesting time at image we came in we did image books we needed to go and get work at marvel and dc and that was a lot of our goal so we we did the marvel and dc stuff and then found ourselves really just hoping we could get back to image we just wanted to get back to and i think that we thought originally that like oh like you were saying, like, like, like drawing Daredevil was going to be my thing, right? That was going to be, well, Daredevil, you know, yeah, of course I mean, you got exception you got Daredevil, right? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> but, but, you know, like, like you, you want, you know, um, for me, I mean, the first, you know, I drew issues of detective comics like that for me was, was mind blowing. Um, it still is. I mean, it's still, there's, there's no like, you know, and I, now I just hate myself for not being better whenever I worked on them. But, um, but, but, you know, you, you, you do things and you, you're, you're part of a, of a history with those things, but then realizing like, Hey, I enjoyed this. I appreciated this. 
but owning my own things, creating my own things and telling stories my way is the important point. That's what I need. And, uh, I don't know, you know, I, I'm not going to say I, I, I pro you know, like it would be a stupid bit of bravado for me to go. I'm never going to go work on, uh, you know what, probably at some point, if, if, if I get a call from, you know, if, if Hickman called me, you know, tomorrow and said, Hey, you know, uh, we're going to do this special thing. Do you want to come in and write and draw a Wolverine story? I, you know, I would do it. I mean, that's just the, that's the reality of it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to front, but, but I do, but I do want to tell my stories my way. And that's always what I'm going to work to get back to. Well, and I think that should be the goal at the end of the day for anyone, anyone that's a creator, regardless of uh, what milieu you choose to work in, whether what publisher you're working with. I mean, do, you know, say what's in your heart mm -hmm. and hopefully your head can find the words to follow. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, I know, I know people out there that there's always that conversation about like, what's the trend, you know, like what, like, you know, like, Ooh, Westerns are really hot right now. So then everybody's trying to do a Western Yeah. by the time that you're done writing the Western because it's hot, it's, it's going to be, you know, no, there, nobody's going to be wanting a Western anymore. And suddenly you're going to have 30 Western books that are all a year too late, you know, or zombies or whatever that thing is. It's like, it's like, it doesn't matter what the genre is, you know, uh, with, with science fiction. So an, an easy example is, um, I feel like the red mother has come in the past year where horror stories have been kind of hot. And then science fiction, there's a lot of kind of new science fiction stuff getting ready to come out right now. And, and science, you know, 40 seconds is kind of on trend. Maybe I've looked out there. But those stories are just there because I want to tell them that way. You know, yeah. it's, it, there's never any calculation. There's never any, you know, and maybe companies are doing that a little bit. Maybe whenever I said, you know, if I, if I had said, hey, I want to tell a sappy teen drama instead of 40 seconds, you know, maybe they would have been like, eh, we'll hold off on that one. But letting me do 40 seconds the way that I did, you know, has, has you know, it, it's just it's just me doing what I want to do the way I want to do it. And I mean, I think that's an awesome thing. Uh, and again, I think that's what everyone that's creative sh or has that creative impulse should aspire to. Um, we're, we're, we're uh, you know, we're lucky to be living in a time in comics where there's not only this wealth of just awesome and unique material out there to choose from, but there's a myriad of different ways to get to actually consume it. And mm -hmm. uh, like you said, three pages at a time on Patreon, Kickstarter, um, uh, Comixology. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's just I, I, per, you know, I think that those options, uh, web comics, uh, I think those options are probably what's fueling the creative resurgence or surge, surge, whatever you want to put it that like you and Daniel Warren Johnson and um, Rick Remender, you know, uh, whomever are, are feeling right now. Um, Nick, Mike, do you have any, anything on to contribute to contribute to that, that train of thought that went off the rails slightly? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really just a big thank you because yeah. it comes yeah. through in the stories, um, hard and the emotion and, just the willingness to tell a good story is it's easy to appreciate on our side of things because it, it comes through in the books that we're able to, you know, download off Comixology or go to our local comic shop and pick up off the shelves. So yeah, I mean, really on my end, it's just a big thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, once again, thanks for taking the time and I'd be the first one to say, if you ever want to market and put the uh, Haunterverse on a t-shirt, uh, a being a headband, <laughs> Um, yeah, let me know. Oh, I, I, I actually, uh, uh, <laughs> while while we were were chatting a few minutes ago, I actually did start the hashtag on Twitter. Hanover. Nice, so, nice. You're welcome. Uh, I uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. I you know I'm the, sure the, aware, it's I, I like the point that it's going to say it's like 
there's like the little three next to the number of times that Hanaverse has been used. When it goes up to four, I'll celebrate. I'll just be okay. like, yes. Yeah. Nick, Mike, you guys have your job after the show's over. <laughs> it's going to be trending yeah. tonight. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, God. Jeremy, thank you so much for hanging out with us this evening. Um, it, it's been a real blast, a real treat to have you here. Yeah. And, um, and man, it's, you know, listeners, check out 40 Seconds on Comixology. Check out Red Mother from Boom. Go back. Check out The Realm. Check out The Beauty. Uh, check out the issues of Detective Comics that Jeremy drew. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, our guest this week's been Mr. Jeremy Hahn. This has been episode number 102 of the Comic Watchers show. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Matt. This is Nick. That's Mike. And as always, support your local comic store, read comics in general, and be good to one another. Thank you so much. Thanks, fellas. <laughs>